Now that we've looked at the evolution of cells and some possibilities of how they would have developed over time, we want to look at how cells actually function. What is their structure and what are the organelles and different components inside of them that allow cells to carry out all the essential functions of life. And this is for IBA 2.2. So organisms can be single cell or multicell, and a single cell organism carries out all of the functions of life just as a multicellular organism would do. They're just a single cell. And there's lots of different single cell organisms that exist on our planets, uh, far more than multicellular organisms. And the number of cells that make up an organism, if it's multicellular, for example, uh, a human that's about 150 pounds is going to have about 40 trillion different cells. And that is a mind boggling amount of different cells. Uh, those cells, some of them die and are replaced. They have a life cycle. Um, and so organisms that are multicellular have lots of different specialized cells. And we'll talk about that specialization a little bit later. How do we know that cells exist and, and where did all of that information come from? In the 17th century, two scientists are kind of known for this, uh, Robert Hooke and Antoine Leon Hooke, uh, are two of the scientists that really started to be curious about what was inside of, of organisms and begin to look at individual cells. And the microscope was really a key development in this process uh, because cells are typically pretty small. They have a very typical, uh, typical small size. Being able to see them with your naked eye is challenging, if not impossible. And so the development of the microscope really allowed this um, uh, it allowed us to be able to, to draw some conclusions and see what's, what's going on with the microscopes. Um, and the, the cell theory that all organisms uh, contain cells or cells are the smallest unit of life it was really based off of inductive reasoning. And uh, these two scientists, as well as some others, began to look at different tissues and different samples. Um, they looked at some cork, uh, looking at embryos, uh, the pith of some elder plants, cartilage of frogs, uh, and, and noticed that all of these different things had cells. Uh, and that name cell actually originated from because it looks like a jail cell because uh, it was an enclosed capture. And so that's where that name for cells came from. And identifying or noticing that all of these different uh, samples had cells within them led to the inductive uh, reasoning that cells are the, the basis of life. Um, and so all living things are made up of one or more cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life. And they now, as we've discussed, come from pre-existing cells. Although there are some cells that don't really fit with our cell theory, um, uh, it, that theory is not rejected. There's just some outliers. And typically in biology, there's kind of established rules or expectations of what we would expect to see, but there always seems to be some outlier. There's something that doesn't quite fit with what we expect or what, we, um, what would fit with the theory. And we'll talk about some of those examples of cells that are kind of atypical in terms of the the, the different theory. And so in this video, we're going to look at the different structure of the cells uh, and, and what different components make up those cells. So part of this unit is also really focused on developing microscope skills and being able to use microscopes. And while that's not really possible through a video, uh, if, if you're in my class, we will be doing that in class. If you're outside of uh, my class, I uh, would recommend that you make sure that you have an opportunity to use microscopes to view plant and animal cells uh, and also um, to, to spend some time uh, looking up some electron micrograph images of the different organelles that we find within cells. So the development of microscopes was essential for us to be able to further study cells. With the naked eye, we can see uh, items that are about point, 0 0.1 uh, millimeters, so pretty small, but uh, these would be like an individual uh, grain of salt, a piece of rice, uh, a period at the end of a sentence in 12 size font. Uh, those are all things that we can see with the naked eye, but really to, to be able to see things at a much smaller level, we need microscopes. And this is particularly with uh, a double lens microscope. And so if you've ever used a microscope before, you look through the eyepiece, uh, that's typically 10x magnification. And then you have a rotating set of lenses and typically the, the highest lens is about 40x. And so those two multiplied together allow us to look at objects that are 400 times magnified and that allows us to be able to see much smaller components and the components of, of cells. Microscopes were first invented in the 17th century. Uh, obviously there's been lots of advancements since then. In the 19th century advancements allowed uh, bacteria and unicellular organisms to be able to be observed. Uh, chromosomes, mitosis, uh, this, the process of mitosis and meiosis, as well as individual gamete cells, uh, sperm and egg cells. And 
those developments led to an improvement of the magnification. Uh, and there's a couple different types of microscopes. The ones that, that we would use in, in my typical classroom would be a light microscope, uh, and they use lights to be able to observe the specimen. Typically, they don't kill the specimen. Um, sometimes if the light gets too hot, it can cause some problems for the organism, but they typically don't kill the organism, and you can even see sometimes them moving around a little bit depending on the size. More recent advancements uh, in the 1930s, so much more recent, uh, are electron microscopes. And these use beams of electrons instead of lights to be able to view the image. Uh, and not surprisingly, these are much, much more powerful and they can magnify up to a million times rather than just the 400-ish X of light microscopes. Uh, and so they allow much smaller objects to be able to be viewed. And you can actually see using electron microscope images, uh, you, can, you can see individual organelles within cells and their structures and the different components of them. Um, some of the negatives is uh, they do typically end up killing the specimen uh, and, and uh, the images that are produced are black and white. It is possible to use some staining or some post uh, image editing uh, using computer software to be able to apply some colors to be able to distinguish different components. There are a number of different developments in microscopes that have really allowed us to really be able to see different components of the cells even better than just electron micrographs. And one such example is a fluorescent stain. Uh, it's possible to stain specific structures as some substances will bind to chemicals and not others. And a good example of this is found with methylene blue. It's a chemical that will bind to DNA and RNA. And so you can actually see where those different uh, uh, components, the DNA specifically is at, uh, within the cell. Uh, they, they show up blue and you can see that in the image here. Uh, stains have been used for about a hundred years and how this works is the light from the microscope is absorbed and then re-emitted by the sample and it creates really bright images. So, so as you can see in the picture it's, it's uh, very easy to see the different components of the cell. Another development that's similar is immunofluorescence, uh, and this is somewhat similar to the staining, but antibodies that, that bind to particular chemicals uh, in the cell that are produced, they're tagged or, or marked with fluorescent markers of different colors, and they're linked to those antibodies. And so this allows images that, that can show where chemicals are located, and you can show multiple different um, different chemicals uh, because of those tagging of the antibodies in, in the cell at one time. And so you can find um, the location of a specific type of protein and where it's being produced or if it's present or if it's absent and also allows really clear uh, colorful images to be produced because of this antibody tagging. Another development is called freeze fracture electron microscopy, and this is uh, essentially making a mold of the cell. Uh, how this process works is the cell is frozen, uh, and then a steel blade fractures the frozen sample, and typically where the cell is going to break or fracture in half is, is the weakest point, and that weakest point is typically in the middle of the cell, uh, kind of in between. Like if you were to cut it right in the middle, usually that's the weakest point, so it kind of splits in half, and the ice that, that remains from being frozen is removed by vaporization. This is the etching. And then you have essentially half of the cell and at, at an angle, a uh, vapor of, of platinum or carbon is fired onto that fractured surface and it creates a coating. And once that coating is removed, it, re it creates a replica of the fractured surface that you can then examine under a light microscope or an electron microscope. And this allows uh, a, a really good 3D image of the cell to be produced that can then be viewed under the microscope so you can have a better sense of the, the physical structure and layout because of this 3D image. Our third development that we want to discuss is cryogenic electron microscopy, uh, or also oftentimes called cryo-EM. And this one is really useful to be able to study proteins uh, that help to carry out the functions of the cell. And how this, uh, this process works is a thin layer of pure protein solution is applied to a grid. And that solution is flash frozen to prevent water crystals from being able to form. And the grid with the frozen protein solution is placed in an electron microscope and the patterns of electrons emitted from the proteins are recorded. Uh, the proteins, it's like a, just a, a gel that forms uh, and they're randomly arranged within that uh, protein solution that's initially poured into that grill. And so there's lots of different patterns um, and it would be very difficult for a human to be able to analyze and, and actually figure out the structure. But using computer software and algorithms, uh, the software can combine all of those patterns to produce a 3D image. And what's really cool about this is the proteins are observed at the instance of when they were frozen. 
Uh, so it's possible for researchers, scientists to be able to extract the proteins, uh, take them when they're actually performing a function or carrying out their function, freeze them in that instant and so that you could actually see what's taking place. And so if you do this at multiple steps of an overall process, you can really be able to see how that process is taking place and how the proteins are carrying out their functions. And this can give resolutions of 0.12 nanometers, which is mind boggling small, uh, and now even smaller than that uh, or, or better than those nanometers, allowing um, uh, even individual atoms to be viewed. And so this is a, a um, a function, uh, a process that's really useful for observing the functions of proteins. So all cells, regardless of their type, have very common structures and components that are found in all different types of cells, whether they're prokaryotes or eukaryotes, plants or animals. Um, they all have a, a couple of different components that's, that are found in all of them. And um, the, the first one is a plasma membrane. And this is also uh, sometimes called the phospholipid bilayer because it's made of a bilayer of phospholipids. We'll look at the, the structure of the membrane in more detail a little bit more in the future. Uh, and this helps to create the outer barrier uh, in an internal internal and external environment. And it also controls what goes in and out of the cell, uh, can pump substances in or out, helps to maintain different concentrations of substances internally and externally. Uh, it's composed of phospholipids, as we discussed, the, that are hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Uh, and sometimes they actually can burst. Uh, this is called lysis when the cell, the, the membrane bursts. And this can be caused by pressure or viruses. We'll talk about viruses in our next video. Uh, and, and when that cell bursts, it does cause the cell to, to die, uh, kills the cell. The second component that all cells have is a cytoplasm, and water is the main component uh, with other dissolved substances of the cytoplasm, and it's kind of like the internal, almost like a little jelly substance that is surround, uh, surrounds all the other internal components of the cell. Uh, it's typically the location of where chemical reactions take place, and it uh, represents the metabolism of the, of the cell where energy and uh, proteins would be produced uh, because the dissolved substances in that liquid environment provides a really good medium for chemical reactions to be able to take place. The third component that cells have is DNA, and as we've talked about, DNA is the genetic information. Nucleotides make up uh, DNA, nucleic acids, and sections of DNA have cl clear instructions to be able to make proteins. So a gene makes a protein. A gene is a section of DNA. We'll talk about DNA more uh, in the future of how it's replicated. And DNA is essential to the survival of the cell. As a result of DNA producing proteins, proteins are responsible for making ribosomes. And so thus, all cells have ribosomes. Also, because they have DNA and DNA is used to make proteins, all cells are going to have ribosomes. Prokaryotes are known as typically bacteria, and these are the first organisms that would have evolved on Earth. They have the most simple structure, uh, and they're very different than eukaryotes, plants, animals, and fungi. Um, they're typically much, much smaller than eukaryotes. They have a size of about one to three microns, uh, whereas eukaryote cells are typically 10 to 100 microns in size, so much smaller. They're found basically everywhere, soil, water, on our skin, inside of our intestines. They help with uh, digestion uh, and hot volcanic water. Prokaryotes have evolved to exist pretty much everywhere on the planet. Some of their characteristics uh, are that they all have a cell wall. Eukaryotes, that's not always the case. And that cell wall contains peptoglycan, which helps uh, to prevent bursting of the cell. It, it creates a strong barrier. Uh, the cytoplasm within it has a single chamber. Uh, it doesn't have additional membranes. And, and the, the cell itself, different from eukaryotes, it doesn't have internal organelles besides ribosomes. It doesn't have membrane-bound organelles. So one of the distinguishing features of eukaryotes, as we'll talk about in a moment, is that it has a nucleus. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. The ribosomes of prokaryotes are called 70S ribosomes. Uh, they're smaller than what's found in eukaryotes, and that S stands for Sedberg units, uh, which is a rate at which a particular particle sinks during centrifuge. So centrifuge is uh, spinning the material very, very quickly. Um, and uh, the rate at which that sinks is that measurement. And so ribosomes in prokaryotes are different than those that are found in eukaryotes. Within prokaryotes, the DNA is concentrated 
and a single molecule that forms a loop or a circle. It's kind of like naked DNA because it doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have uh, the, the protection of a nucleus, and so it's called the nucleoid region. And in our electron micrograph image that you can see here, typically we see this area as being uh, lighter. Um, it's that portion that's a little bit lighter, and that's where that nucleoid region is, is uh, where, where it's at. Um, Prokaryote cells contain ribosomes. Uh, they can produce proteins, and the type of proteins uh, that carry out functions are called enzymes. We'll talk about those more in the future, and so prokaryotes have all of those. They can also have a flagella, uh, which is sometimes found in eukaryotic cells. Also, sperm have a flagella, that's the tail, and they can also have a structure called pili, which helps with attachment to, typically between different prokaryotic cells. And so, in, in summary, prokaryotes are much smaller and at least in terms of organelles, they're less advanced. They don't have organelles, membrane-bound organelles like eukaryotic cells do, uh, but they're everywhere on the planet and have evolved to exist in lots of different environments.